Have you ever wondered about the game of Dungeons and Dragons? What is it about? And why does it hold such fascination for certain people, especially young, well-educated, and gifted people? Here to tell you about Dungeons and Dragons is author and speaker Joan Hake Roby. The bizarre cast list of characters includes demons, dragons, witches, zombies, harpies, gnomes, and creatures who cast spells and exercise supernatural powers. It dabbles with demonic spirits and promotes the influence of the occult. It encourages sex and violence. It is a form of devil worship. It has been banned from the public schools in Utah, summer recreational programs in California, and a minister in Kansas wants to collect money to purchase and burn every copy he can find. The controversy surrounding Dungeons and Dragons continues, as does the popularity of this anti-religious role-playing game that encourages players to fantasize forbidden temptations of the civilized world. Bloodshed, mayhem, and murder are common events as players pretend to pillage, rape, and cast magic spells in their quest for riches, knowledge, and superhuman powers. This is a game of human violence that features occult practices such as magic, sorcery, divination, casting spells, and having powers over others, especially demons. Many of the spells and magic used are described in books of witchcraft. At the very least, Dungeons and Dragons is an obsessive retreat from reality. Psychologists have claimed again and again that when someone lives in the realm of fantasy for an extended length of time, the lines dividing reality and fantasy become blurred. This is a real and increasing danger. One player reported as saying, the more I play D&D, the more I want to get away from this world. The whole thing is getting very bad. In my book, Turmoil in the Toy Box 2, I have devoted two chapters on this complicated game mired in witchcraft and the occult that has developed like a cult-like following that becomes extremely defensive when the game is criticized. Since young, well-educated, and gifted people, especially males, are most susceptible to this game, I have invited a young man to take a look at Dungeons and Dragons with me. His name is Ben Crothy, and his credits include radio announcer, actor, and parent. Hello, Ben. Welcome to a discussion of the game Dungeons and Dragons. Thank you, Joan. I'm glad to be able to take a look at Dungeons and Dragons with you. Then let's begin. Unlike other board games, Dungeons and Dragons becomes a compulsive force in the lives of those who play it. Dungeons and Dragons, commonly referred to as D&D, requires each player to make a philosophical, religious, and moral decision, whereas ordinary games do not. Eventually, the more a player participates in the game, the more he chooses to remain in the fantasy world, and the harder it will be for him to accept his responsibilities in the real world. The makeup of the game lends itself to an undisciplined overindulgence, as its creator, Gary Gygax, said, You have to pursue D&D with your whole soul if you're going to do well at it. When doing this, pursuing the game with his whole soul, a player often has trouble differentiating between the game and reality. We must recognize the dangers of our children spending so much time playing this game. Not only does it lead to a distortion of reality, but it fills the child's mind with images of the occult. The Word reminds us that Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Playing Dungeons and Dragons is definitely not a wise way to make the most of your time. We must realize and teach our children that when the burdens of life get too heavy, we do not have to turn to fantasy because Jesus has already provided an escape. He is our hope and our salvation. He certainly is. Dungeons and Dragons has been around a long time. How does it maintain its popularity? The game of Dungeons and Dragons is a tremendously gripping fantasy role-playing game. 
Where most games have a three-year life cycle, Dungeons & Dragons and its derivatives have been popular for over 15 years. TSR, the manufacturer of Dungeons & Dragons and its accessories, support their products with comprehensive, aggressive advertising campaigns and promotions. Their products appear inside almost every issue of DC and Marvel Comics, which reach 40 million readers each month. And they are continually adding new books and developing new products. For example, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons has been released in a second edition. It is billed as having all new monsters, described in a three-volume Monsters Compendium. Also available now is a simplified version of the game, Dungeon, according to magazine advertisements for eight-year-olds, offers, and I quote, a rompin', stompin', roaring good time of monster bashing, dungeon crawling, and treasure collecting for the entire family. Dwarf, elf, warrior, magic user, cleric, and fighter. One, any, or all, enter the depths of a dungeon notorious for the ferocity of its monsters and the hordes of treasures stored within its dank walls. TSR is also licensing out many of its key products to become a line of comics and computer game software. How many gamesmen actually play D&D? About one million people, both in the United States and abroad. Joan, can you explain how this compelling game is played? The basic set, introduced in 1974, begins with a 63-page player's manual and a 48-page rulebook. Players are given background information on monsters, magic spells, and treasures. Dungeons and Dragons is extremely complicated and time-consuming. One player, the Dungeon Master, runs the game. He maps out on paper his own elaborate maze of rooms and corridors filled with monsters, traps, magic items, guardians, and treasure. The dungeon master is a referee, diecaster, and all-around god. Life magazine describes him as an all-knowing and all-seeing MC. He is the most powerful person in the universe. His chief sources are Greek mythology and medieval history. Other players have no idea what is waiting for them when they assume the role of a specific character who has special abilities. Dungeons & Dragons is a game that takes place almost entirely within the minds of its players. There are no cards, no board, no play money. Each player chooses a physical shape, from human to elf, dwarf, gnome, or half-orc. The player assumes a role or profession, which I will explain in detail later, an immoral alignment from lawful good to chaotic evil. Players can arm their characters with a variety of ominous weapons such as daggers, hand axes, swords, and battle axes. They are also equipped with special aids to survive their journey through the dungeons. Magical weapons, potions, spells, and magic trinkets such as holy water, garlic, and wolfsbane. By rolling dice, a player determines the strengths and weaknesses of his character in terms of intelligence, wisdom, strength, dexterity, and charisma. The personalities of the characters turn out to be combinations of people's idealized alter egos and their less-than-ideal impulses. Another dice roll determines hit points, or the amount of physical punishment a character can endure without dying. Roll of dice also determines starting cash. Okay, the player chooses the character. Then what? What is the object of the game? Players are motivated almost entirely by greed as their characters band together to fight their way through the monster-laden maze, grabbing as much treasure as they can. The dungeon master rolls the dice to determine what horrors they will encounter. The dungeon itself is studded with forbidding obstacles. A player may have to fend off attacks from rapacious bands of gnomes, screeching harpies, and vicious were-rats, or he may be stymied by paralyzing gray ooze. The success of his journey depends on his assigned skills and the judgment of the omnipotent dungeon master. This sounds very complicated. 
It is a very complicated game with elaborate rules, endless note-taking, map-drawing, probability charts, and oddly-shaped dice. Players use a map and miniature figures to plot their course. They keep track of details on graph paper, but the game is largely in the minds of the players. The dungeon master creates a dramatic situation. It usually consists of a set of maps that carefully notes every trap, treasure, monster, and magical device the heroes of the story are likely to find. Charms or magic spells are often used by players or the dungeon master. Counter magic or lucky rolls of the dice can save the character from a spell. Thus, a game can go on for years. The dungeon master plays the parts of all the bad guys and monsters while players decide the character's actions. While this is another part of D&D's appeal, some players have been devastated to the point of suicidal depression when a wrong decision on their part led to the death of a character with whom they equated closely. Combat and magic are resolved by the roll of the dice. At the end of the game, the characters are awarded any earned treasure and an increment of experience which elevates them toward still more superhuman powers. Characters carry to their next game previously acquired possessions and experience, each player following his character's career through until death. I would like to read something to you. Do you have Gygax's autograph? A teenager was overheard to ask. I'll give you $100. How about $150? This man is a genius. When he wrote the rules for D&D, his hand was guided. Does this surprise you, Joan? No. Habitual game players tend to say things like that about the man they call the creator. Gary Gygax is the most visible of the men behind the role-playing games. He has been dubbed the darling of the game industry, basking in his role as a cult figure. He is also the man some people equate with the devil. Let me tell you what I've learned about the man who invented Dungeons and Dragons. Gary Gygax was a board insurance underwriter and inveterate games player who had mastered chess at the age of six. And as an adolescent, he spent his allowance on miniature metal soldiers and staged battlefield maneuvers. He loved games and the myths and fairy tales told him by his father. He became a war game aficionado as a college student during the 1960s and was part of a group that met on weekends to reenact historic battles using miniature figures. His particular passion became writing war games for toy soldiers called Miniatures Rules, just as H.G. Wells had done. One day, Gygax dreamed up and wrote down a sort of war game not confined to historical reality at all, but rather a mythic fantasy game that would draw on his extensive reading of such books as Arms and Armor, The Welsh Wars of Edward I, and much fantasy fiction. He called it Dungeons and Dragons. It was rejected by two game companies who said it was too complicated and open-ended. If Guy Gax had not lost his insurance job, that might have been the end of Dungeons and Dragons. Losing his job shocked him into asking himself what he really wanted to do with his life. The answer was to earn a living from creating games. Gygax began to see weak spots in the sales appeal of Dungeons & Dragons. One was the amount of time it took to prepare for a game. Four or five hours, much of it spent on creating a dungeon. Another drawback was that many potential players needed to have their imagination stimulated. As a result, Gygax employed his rich inner fantasy life and imagination to package ready-made fantasy dungeon settings called modules with names such as Vault of the Dro and Glacial Rift of the Frost Giant Jarl. The Dungeon Master's Guide, the Player's Handbook, and lavishly illustrated Monster Manual and Gods, Demigods, and Heroes found a ready-made audience. Joan, earlier you mentioned that Dungeons & Dragons has been popular for 15 years. How did it get its start? The Tactical Studies Rules Association 
later incorporated as TSR, was founded by Gary Gygax and Don Kay in 1973 with a total investment of $1,000. Gygax, with a man named Flint Dilly, created the game of Dungeons and & Dragons and first marketed it in 1974. It took nearly a year for Gygax to sell the first 1,000 official copies of Dungeons & Dragons printed that year, but the second 2,000 booklet order disappeared in just five months. By 1978, sales had hit $2.2 million and grossed $20 million in 1980. The game was selling at a rate of 1,000 per month. Gygax must have had a very vivid imagination. Exactly where do the monsters of Dungeons & Dragons come from? First, let me paraphrase the Monster Manual. The manticore is a huge lion-bodied monstrosity with a human face, dragon wings, and a tail full of iron spikes. The 24 spikes can be fired, six at a time, like a crossbow with a 180-foot range. Their favorite prey is man. Sounds dreadful, doesn't it? However, even a manticore takes a backseat to a dragon, of which there are four different species, white, black, red, and brass. Brass is the worst. All dragons breathe fire and spew sleep, magic, and fear all over the place. Being intelligent creatures, they can be negotiated with on occasion, and the older they are, the more treasure they conceal. To answer your question, the world of Dungeons and Dragons is based on the legends, fairy tales, and literature of Western Europe, with a scattering of items from other cultures. To some extent, it resembles the Middle-earth of J.R.R. Tolkien's grand epic, Lord of the Rings, or the novels of H.G. Wells. Gygax himself compares it to a boom town in the Alaskan gold rush. The value of everything is inflated. Money is cheap. Adventurers are bringing gold and jewels out of the dungeons by the bucket full, and magic items abound. The rules of D&D conform to a common background of myth and fairy tales. It is a medieval world, one without modern technology or gunpowder, but one with compensatory magic as the technology. Telepathy replaces radio, the crystal ball replaces television, and the fireball spell takes the place of the cannon and the machine gun. Dr. Gary North, the author of None Dare Call It Witchcraft, has a lot to say about Dungeons and & Dragons and other fantasy games. Here I quote, After years of study of the history of occultism, after having researched a book on the subject, and after having consulted with scholars in the field of historical research, I can say with confidence, these games are the most effective, most magnificently packaged, most profitably marketed, most thoroughly researched introduction to the occult and man's recorded history. Joan, do you agree with Dr. North's assessment of the game? Oh, yes. I agree, and there's more to it. Let's look at one game of Dungeons & Dragons. The magician sets off a charm person spell, thieves ransack a house, characters destroy another by setting its roof on fire. The players of this particular game of Dungeons & Dragons are medical students in their 20s, and the dungeon master is a professor at the University of Southern California School of Medicine and a physician. One kindly physician's favorite character is a submaronic dwarf who constantly chants, Kill! Kill! Hack, slash, loot, pillage, and burn prevail in the game. The level of violence runs high. There is hardly a game in which players do not indulge in murder, arson, torture, rape, or highway robbery, states the game's dungeon master. The dwarf character drinks too much, tries to sexually assault a female character, and gets into a fight. Enthusiasts of Dungeons & Dragons defend the violence in the game by saying that the dungeon master must provide an interesting game. The characters should always feel a sense of danger and lurking menace, but should be able to swagger through much of their world with the firm knowledge that they are heroes. Unfortunately for some, the make-believe world assumes an eerie sense of reality. 
This is really the first commercial attempt to provide a game where the players can really use their imaginations and ingenuity freely, says Gary Gygax himself. If you run into a dragon sitting on a pile of treasure, you can attack it and attempt to slay it. You can try to negotiate with it. You can use trickery. You can run away if you don't think you can handle it and maybe come back another time. Or you can get unlucky and be burned to a crisp by its breath. That doesn't sound inviting to me. Let me review. When a person decides to play Dungeons & Dragons, he in essence becomes a certain character. He's the same character game after game. There are six races from which a player can choose. Dwarf, Elf, Gnome, Half-Elf, Halfling, Half-Orc, and Human. Once a player has chosen a race, how does he get his magical power? The player must also have an occupation. There are several from which he can choose. Clerics can wear armor and carry weapons, but in accordance with medieval tradition, they may not draw blood. They are therefore restricted to blunt weapons and cannot fire arrows. They can do spells and can heal wounds. Clerics are also able to drive away undead creatures and perform miracles. A druid is a cleric of nature with powers over animals and plants. A fighter wears all types of armor that he can afford. He can wield any weapon. A paladin is a fighter of holy order sworn to chastity and goodness, like the knights of the round table with certain special powers. Rangers are lone woodsmen with special tracking and magical abilities. A magic user's mighty spells are limited. He can only use a small number of spells per game. He carries only a dagger. An illusionist is a magic user whose spells are limited to those which deceive the senses. The thief wears light armor. He can detect trap doors, secret panels, and pick locks. He hides in shadows, climbs sheer walls, and can pick pockets. A monk is a specialist in kung fu type of bare-handed combat and has other abilities as well. An assassin is a thief monk who specializes in lethal attacks. A bard is a fighter who casts magic spells by singing. After he chooses an occupation, a roll of the dice determines how much money a character will have for necessities, as well as the traits that you mentioned earlier. I understand that he can get more money by capturing treasures, but is there any other way that a character can change during a game? Characters develop as adventures unfold. Accumulated treasures allow him to hire a handful of assassins and slaves, or buy weapons, magical trinkets, and so forth. Characters become harder to kill because of increased hit points. In Dungeons and Dragons, a character can receive a certain number of injuries or hits without consequence. As a character lives through game after game, he becomes more indestructible, able to receive attacks by more and more severe weapons without being weakened. Their increased level of experience allows them to become more and more powerful in battle. In other words, a character becomes godlike? Since the player associates so closely with his character, he actually sees himself as becoming indestructible, almost superhuman? Yes, and that has precipitated some very sad consequences which I will explore at a later time. But first of all, another real concern is that Dungeons & Dragons offers the player the opportunity to cast himself into roles associated with demon powers. In his imagination, he assumes the role of a sorcerer or some superhuman character who possesses extraordinary abilities. The game encourages the use of sorcery, witchcraft, and magic. It is through the casting of spells and enchantments that a character breaks the powers of others seeking to destroy him on his quest for treasure. Gary Gygax is quoted as saying, Every player at some point, particularly if he's a wizard, decides he's going to start manufacturing his own potions and making his own magic items. So, in Dungeons & Dragons, the characters are magical or super powerful. They venture into a dangerous situation in search of treasure and are attacked by magical mythological creatures. With a little skill and luck, 
they defeat the monsters and carry off a treasure of gold, even more magical items, or other valuables. That is correct. And the rules of the game allow for resurrection and reincarnation. A dungeon master can also offer, as an alternative to death, a wish ring. A cleric can heal by the laying on of hands or by healing spells or potions. Dungeons and Dragons promotes the pagan concept of more than one god, divine intervention, and healing. When placed into an impossible situation, one character responded to the Dungeons Master's question, What are you going to do? with, I'm going to get down on my knees and pray real hard. But to whom are they praying? Gods of good are noted as being Solinary and Habakkuk. Hadukal and Zeboam are gods of evil. This is a far cry from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. John Eric Holmes is an author and medical school professor. He's also an avid Dungeons & Dragons player. I'd like to read what he says about fantasy games. It is just because bloodshed, mayhem, and murder are impossible, but not unthinkable to the majority of us civilized folks, that a fantasy in which we get to act out such forbidden temptations is so attractive. I think fantasy of some sort is the normal human way to deal with frustration and uncertainty. It's the charm and nostalgia of an adult game of let's pretend that draw most of us to the game. We really want to believe the fantasy characters are real in some universe parallel to our own. We talk about our imaginary selves as if they did have a separate existence, a separate existence much more glamorous and exciting than our own. Role-playing, like other forms of fantasy on film, tape, or papers, is an escape. Some people seem to need this type of escape. The fact that most game players are young males suggests that these people have a special need for escape fantasy. It fulfills the secret desire we all cherish to find a world where the heroes are always handsome, the heroines always lovely, good is always beautiful, and evil always ugly. It is a world as one would like it to be, peopled by a finer or at least more powerful version of our very selves. Joan, would you like to comment on this? The role-playing game makes a fantasy explicit. The player becomes the hero. He must make the decisions, perform the actions, and take the risks that a fictional hero might. In a good game, the sense of personal involvement is immediate. The player says things like, I jump to the top of the rock. I draw my sword. I prepare my most powerful spell. A player carefully guides his character through hour after hour of adventures. Since the rules of the game of Dungeons and Dragons allow only one character per player at a time, he equates with his character almost to the alter ego state. Therefore, when a character gets killed, the player is apt to go into a depression, usually brief but quite real. The characters of a fantasy game take on a life of their own. The players begin to think of them as having an independent existence, somewhere in another dimension of space and time. No one who does not play D&D can understand the shock that comes with the violent death of one's character. It is a little piece of the player that gets killed. For the young player, this death may be a bit too much. So you think that a problem arises when the fantasy becomes too real for a player? Yes, Dungeon masters play the game differently. Some dislike situations in which characters get killed. Others feel the game is successful only when half the players die in battle. Dungeon masters sometimes begin to think, I wonder what really is beyond the southern jungle, forgetting that he alone has the power to put something there. Psychology Today magazine claims that the alternate universe feel to the world of Dungeons and Dragons is produced by its social reality. It is a shared fantasy, not a solitary one, and the group spirit contributes to the tremendous appeal of the game. The Dungeon Master's world is a sort of giant Rorschach test. This is the end of Side 1. Please turn the tape over for Side 2. Exactly who plays Dungeons & Dragons? 
Michael S. Dobson, Director of Marketing for TSR Incorporated, offers a profile of the typical player. He says, Consumers tend to be males who are bright, analytical, and tireless. The typical role-playing gamer is a teenaged white male from a middle-class background. He is above average in intelligence and interested in math and science. He is not particularly athletic, and he reads a lot, especially science fiction and fantasy. He has a small circle of friends, mostly his own age, with whom he plays the game on a weekly or even daily basis. An unusually high percentage of these teenage gamers will go on to college. The other attribute they all possess, of course, is an extremely active imagination. I understand that most players are content to play the game on paper in their homes. But some of the aficionados have been known to dress up in medieval costumes and get physically involved in the action. Yes, some Dungeons & Dragons zealots carry the game to extremes. At one university, students complain that players overload the school's computer with complex scenarios. In Texas, one group of fans meet each Sunday for Dungeons & Dragons combat practice dressed in medieval attire and armed with rattan replicas of ancient weaponry. I've seen some people become so involved that they try to become their characters, observed a student at the University of Georgia. But most players understand that it is just a game. True, some D&D players realize that this is simply a game, but far too many enthusiasts harm others either intentionally or inadvertently in their pursuit of the perfect game of Dungeons and Dragons. Let's look at some typical players. Ben, will you tell us about a player named Gary Huckabay? Yes, this profile of a typical player comes from Life magazine, where Gary Huckabee is quoted, It's fun to put half-orc babies in a catapult and fire them at a wall. They splat very nicely. I also enjoy cutting off their eyelashes, mopping their faces with a mace, and melting them with green slime. When I compare my real life and the life I lead as a dungeon master, there's no doubt in my mind as to which is the richer. He defends the game by saying, I've never met a player who thought a game was really happening. It's just a creative way of relieving your frustrations on a symbolic level. Some people scrunch their wives. I scrunch monsters instead. Gary started reading when he was two, started making up new games at four, and at eight was designing new buildings. At ten, he started dreaming up new life forms. At twelve, he discovered a world that combined everything he loved. Stories, games, architecture, and the creation of a new species. Gary is a scholar of fantasy, Leading figures of Greek mythology and medieval history are as familiar to him as the characters in TV series are to most boys his age. When not actually playing, Gary spends his evenings on dungeon diagrams, character records, and descriptions of new monsters, deities, and spells which have filled 1,500 pages. In class, he daydreams about the traps and tortures that will await his friends as soon as he can shuck the humdrum guise of a high school student and in a blinding metamorphosis become a wizard, a god. Gary has spent a year designing and mapping his dungeon. It has 11 levels, 10 of which are covered with algae, filth, and slime. They even have carrion and dead bodies floating around. This, to him, is the life that is richer. Gary has chosen the evil alignment for his characters. He explains, If I don't like a law, I break it. If I don't like a player, I kill him. Evil characters have so much more freedom, don't you think? He estimates he's spent over $2,000 on D&D, mostly for transportation to conventions, and over 6,000 hours developing a private Dungeons & Dragons computer simulation on his Apple II home computer. All of his close friends are also Dungeons & Dragons players. Another player profile comes from a book titled Dungeon Master, The Disappearance of James Dallas Egbert III, authored by William Deere. Mr. Deere was hired by Dallas Egbert's parents to find their son, a 16-year-old sophomore at Michigan State. 
Dallas vanished from that campus in the summer of 1979 under suspicious circumstances. He was an avid Dungeons & Dragons player, and Michigan State had real dungeons, eight and a half miles of steam pipe tunnels, a black hot maze which networked beneath the campus. These were full of false leads, blind corners, hidden rooms, and the real danger of being injured by hot steam jets. Against the rules of the school, students often acted out their D&D game within the tunnels. Dallas was one of these students, and it was following such a game that he was found missing. A lot of controversy arose from the incident. The tunnels were blocked off, and Dungeons and Dragons was banned from the campus. Dallas was a genius who could not make himself understood. He had an obsessive need for detail and control. Did Mr. Deer find Dallas? Yes, Deer did finally find the runaway teenager, who wrote after he reappeared, I'll give Satan my mind and power. Dallas had suffered a marked personality change during his heavy involvement with Dungeons and Dragons, The depression characterized by his Dungeons & Dragons obsession led him one year later to kill himself. This was cited as proof of the game's harmfulness. Have there been other deaths connected with the game? The National Coalition on Television Violence, better known as NCTV, has linked heavy involvement with the violence-oriented fantasy role-playing board games to over 90 deaths. These include 62 murders, 26 suicides, and two deaths of undetermined causes. According to evidence from police reports, courtroom trials, and family interviews, Dungeons & Dragons is said to have played a decisive role in causing 37 of the 90 deaths. In the other cases, a heavy involvement into Dungeons & Dragons is considered to have been a major factor leading to the suicides or murders involved. Do you know of any specific cases... Recent deaths include the case of a 16-year-old New York boy who was convicted of killing an 11-year-old fellow Dungeons & Dragons player following a game. He told police that the younger boy had become evil in the fantasy, and it was his role to extinguish the evil. In another case, two soldiers dressed in ninja martial arts outfits slit the throats of an elderly couple while stealing their jewelry during a break-in. A Dungeons & Dragons martial arts book was found on the dashboard of the truck used by the soldiers. A 17-year-old New York honor student fatally shot four people as part of an elaborate game of Dungeons & Dragons. The teen murdered his father, brother, cousin, and his father's girlfriend after he had been playing a game that he had co-named Inferno, a reference to Dante's Inferno. It was also discovered that he and two other students had stolen parts of two computers and disks from their high school to enable them to keep track of their complicated game. Another adolescent boy shot his brother to death and tried to kill two family members while engaged in Dungeons and Dragons fantasies. That is shocking. I understand there have also been a number of suicides. Gamesmen have left suicide notes in diaries linking Dungeons and Dragons as a cause of their deaths. Pat Pulley, mother of a boy who killed himself, founded an organization called Bothered About D&D, or BAD. Pulling said that her son played Dungeons and Dragons at the time of his suicide. He had become so wrapped up in the game that his grades had begun to suffer. And when another player in a long-running game in the gifted and talented program at his school sent him a curse of suicidal mania, He interpreted it literally and shot himself in the heart. A suicide note clearly linked the game with his death. Pulling described the game manuals as containing detailed descriptions of killing, satanic human sacrifice, assassination, sadism, premeditated murder, and curses of insanity. She added that much of the material comes from demonology, including witchcraft, the occult, and evil monsters. Another 21-year-old committed suicide by shooting himself with a shotgun. He was a Dungeons & Dragons fanatic and dungeon master with half of his bedroom covered with D&D material. Two self-written manuscripts were found open near his body. The police report states that apparently 
D&D became a reality to this young college honor student when he thought that he could leave his body and return. He was following directions on astral travel from the manual at the time of his death. He thought that since he was not inside his body, the bullet would not injure him. A similar death was reported in California, where a 14-year-old asked his brother to shoot him, stating that he was a dungeon master with special powers and could not be hurt. Thomas E. Radecki, M.D., National Coalition on Television Violence Research Director and Psychiatrist, has participated in five of the Dungeons and Dragons burglary and murder trials and has had cases in his own psychiatric practice. In a press interview, he said, From official investigations from the adolescent murders and criminal defendants that I have examined and from my own practice, I have no doubt that these games are causing dozens of deaths, as well as a much larger number of more minor problems. The evidence is overwhelming. Any honest epidemiologic study of these cases would have to conclude that these violent role-playing games are having a serious harmful effect on many young people. While perhaps a hundred young people have been led to murder and suicide, the evidence suggests that thousands have committed more minor antisocial behavior and hundreds of thousands have become more desensitized to violence. NCTV says that in over 80 cases, Dungeons and Dragons has been involved because of its numerous mentions of human sacrifice and the drinking of blood, because characters can be brought back from the dead repeatedly and because players sometimes choose demonic gods to worship as part of the game. Twenty-two different types of satanic demons and devils can be part of the game, and there are dozens of spells of occult magic with some of the material lifted straight out of demonology. NCTV also reports that this has led to an involvement in Satan worship in ten of the murders and suicides. What is it about Dungeons & Dragons that provokes these young players? The game entails various attacks, assassinations, spying, theft, and poisonings. Players can arm their characters with any of 62 different types of weapons. There are 39 different tools that players can use in their torture chambers, 11 types of mercenary soldiers that players can hire who have tendencies to pillage and rape, and 11 types of prostitutes are possible in the game. There are even tables for racial hatred. Combat armor, medieval weaponry, spells, curses, and many forms of mental attack are involved. Holy, unholy water, magic of all types, ESP, mental telepathy, and military combat fill the game. Players can be cursed with 20 different types of insanity. Dr. Radecki gave two cases from his own psychiatric practice. One involved a 12-year-old boy who underwent a personality change after getting involved with the Dungeons and Dragons game. He became too aggressive for his single mother to handle and had to be placed in foster care. In the second case, Radecki hospitalized a 26-year-old woman because of mental exhaustion due to an intense harassment by a former roommate. The roommate had gotten into D&D &D and then into Satan worship with her D&D &D friends. She was making repeated harassing telephone calls, painted a pentagram on the patient's home, and made several attempts to kidnap the patient's nine-year-old daughter. According to Radecki, the D&D &D group had apparently gotten into an animal sacrifice at a city park only blocks from his hospital. National Coalition on Television Violence and Bothered About D&D &D said that in at least 37 instances where young men have murdered themselves or others, there is very solid evidence, including police reports, eyewitnesses, and documents left by the victims, that D&D's influence was a decisive factor. Fifty-three other cases exist where Dungeons and Dragons appears to have played a major role in the thinking of the young males at the time of their violence. Several non-fatal murder attempts by D&D &D groups and one rape where D&D &D played a major role have been reported. Six cases of insanity afflicting young males have been documented where D&D &D appears to have played a major causal role.
the numbers are staggering. Joan, have you personally had any contact with a Dungeons & Dragons player? Yes. I would like to share with you one of the letters that I recently received. This was written by a very misguided young man who was entranced by the game of Dungeons & Dragons. Perhaps some of our research will help to answer not only his questions, but some of the same ones that concerned parents are being asked at home. Ben, will you please read this letter for us? The player begins, In reading your book, Turmoil in the Toy Box, concerning Dungeons and Dragons, I thought I would let you know my point of view. The game focuses on one thing, mythology. Please take note, the first part of the word myth, which means untrue, false. It is apparent that you have researched the rule books to some extent, and if you didn't notice, in the Dungeon Master's Guide and the new second edition version, it clearly states that this game is very flexible when the rules come into play. Also, in the player's handbooks, the spells that require some kind of components do not state what to do with the materials. True, for the spell Spider Climb, a wizard must eat a live spider, but the player doesn't eat the thing. Also, it requires some kind of hand gestures and verbal stuff which no spells describe. I've been playing D&D for 10 years. I'm 19 now. For probably about 9 of those years, I've been a dungeon master. Nobody in my game sees me as a god. Nobody in my game treats their so-called deities with reverence or performs some kind of ritual to it. Nobody who plays clerics constantly pray for their spells. They just get them, no fasting or anything. I feel that they've played their characters well enough and has earned enough experience points to have the spells. When someone playing a wizard in my game casts a spell, they simply state that they're casting it, and boom, it's done. I use no magic circles or pentagrams or junk like that. It's assured if a wizard needs protection, a force field of some sort appears around him when the appropriate spell is cast. Turning away undead is just that. You see, a vampire, a cleric goes boo, and he's gone. Resurrection is an alias for giving dead characters another chance. So what? I have no idea what the goat head sign is. I don't even believe in witches. The word demon, devil, and hell appears in the Bible, do they not? They don't make it any less holy than it is, do they? Fonts and basins are not used in blessing or cursing. It's just done if someone wants to do it. The term blessing and cursing belie his argument here. Webster defines blessing as to pronounce holy. Blessing can be given only to that of the Lord. Philippians tells us, Brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the peace of God will be with you. The young man admits, I guess when it comes to looking at our world in comparison to the world I run in D&D, &D, the D&D &D world, without a doubt, is better. That's just because of all the wonders of the unicorns and dragons, wizards, great noble knights, uh, the whole concept. It's Tolkien, King Arthur, and Robin Hood rolled all into one. I must interrupt you here. Dungeon Master, it is truly sad that you look upon God's world as described in Genesis and name truly good is not as good as your fantasy world, one of sorcerers, clerics, wizards, dragons, and so forth. For Revelations tells us of the gate of the kingdom of God. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and fornicators, murderers and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. To continue Dungeon Master's letter, my beliefs, morals, and sense of right and wrong, I feel are better. Also like the 16-year-old kid you mentioned. But D&D &D is not number one on my list. It's only a game, but a great stress reliever. Here again, I disagree with you, Dungeon Master. As we have already mentioned, Dungeons and Dragons has done just the opposite in the lives of numerous players. The almost 100 documented cases of suicide and murder represent only a small percentage of the mental problems caused by Dungeons and Dragons. No, indeed. 
Dungeons and Dragons is definitely not a stress reliever. The Dungeon Master writes, The only reason why I use gods in my games is because of the mythological nature of them. As being Dungeon Master, I usually play these gods when they're needed. Even then, I don't feel like a god because I know that these are false. There's only one God who I follow and pray to at least four times a day. I feel him constantly, even when playing D&D. I know if this game is wrong, he will stop me from playing. Dear Dungeon Master, God has made us free moral agents. We are not robots to be stopped. He allows us to see the rights and the wrongs of the world by studying his word. Perhaps you should try the Bible when you are seeking true stress relief. And so, as you can see, the Dungeon Master concludes, every person who plays D&D is not corrupted or turned away from Christ. This game has taught me how to cooperate with people, how to get along with them, and with God's blessing, it will continue to do so. Jesus has provided an escape for us, but when we want to get something off our mind, there's nothing like a diversion. I am sorry, Dungeon Master, but God will never bless Dungeons and Dragons or its works. A true blessing for you will be to truly be free of this mind-altering game, and I pray for this blessing to be upon you. All right, Joan, exactly what is wrong with D&D? Some people claim that games such as Dungeons and Dragons are harmless, strictly fun, fantasy, and entertainment. Beware. They are not. Parents who allow such games are playing with dynamite and their children's souls. They open their homes and their children's minds to subtle introduction to the occult and the malignant world of psychotherapy, which is mind alteration and values modification. There is nothing benign about these games. They are part of the increasing spread of the occult, a push that will increase in tempo and fervor as Satan's time grows shorter. Dungeons and Dragons is not a game. Instead, some believe it to be a teaching on demonology, witchcraft, voodoo, murder, rape, blasphemy, suicide, assassination, insanity, sex perversion, homosexuality, prostitution, Satan worship, gambling, Jeunian psychology, barbarism, cannibalism, sadism, desecration, demon summoning, necromantics, and divination. These are all behaviors and practices that God forbids in the Old and the New Testament. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations, there shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Deuteronomy 18, 9-12. Those who participate in Dungeons and Dragons are laid open to a subtle but very powerful form of spiritual, mental, moral, and thus behavioral conditioning that is extremely dangerous for several reasons. The first is violence. Persons participating in Dungeons and Dragons find themselves in a lifestyle where killing, robbery, maiming, destruction, sexual abuse, fear, confusion, hatred, and rebellion are the norm. Players experience values modification. In the universe of Dungeons and Dragons, good is no better or more powerful than evil. In other words, good and evil are presented as equal and opposite poles. Players align themselves with one or the other. However, those who choose good are actually inhibited, while those who adopt evil character traits are more free to pursue selfish goals. There are no penalties for evil conduct. When young people become intensely and emotionally involved with role-playing with this type of base, traditional moral values are destroyed. Personal advancement becomes the guiding factor, and ethics are tossed out the window.
The more deeply a person becomes enmeshed in such role-playing, the more his old value system comes under attack. Undesirable real-life behavior becomes more likely. Dungeons & Dragons encourages reality distortion. Unlike other games, Dungeons & Dragons presents an alternative universe loaded with spine-chilling excitement. Players mentally enter into the plot. Everything is happening around them. They must make life-or-death decisions. Since this is a shared fantasy, the more players that share the fantasy, the more blurred becomes the line between that and reality. Persons who feel inadequate, bored, or alienated from society can be brought to a position where D&D's alternative realities are much more exciting and fulfilling than real life. The results are withdrawal from society, paranoia, and suppressed or expressed hostility. Players can become so emotionally bonded to their characters that when the character is killed, the player becomes devastated to the point of depression. The game is counterproductive. Children or youth who become deeply involved in D&D often spend a vast amount of their waking time and creative energies playing, thinking, dreaming about D&D and planning strategies. Dungeons and Dragons teaches an occult form of religion. Even in its most basic form, the players are introduced to magic, the casting of spells, the use of magic circles, pentagrams, and other psychic devices. Players battle or seek the aid of demons and pagan deities. They are encouraged to align themselves with and worship a deity or deities. Although Dungeons & Dragons is not a religion per se, it does teach religious principles and familiarizes players with terms and rituals of occult forms of religion. However, there are many references to traditional Christian terms, such as atonement, deity, faith, fasting, resurrection, God, prayer, and divine ascension that are treated in a blasphemous manner in the player's handbooks and various other D&D guidebooks. While Dungeons & Dragons players do not in reality practice demon summoning, witchcraft, divination, necromantics, or Satan worship, they are open to these possibilities. Will the young person who has found Dungeons & Dragons so exciting be appalled when he discovers that astral projection, diving the future, healings, and the casting of spells all involve a spiritual power for him to tap? Finally, the more a player participates in the game, the more he chooses to remain in the fantasy world, and the harder it will be for him to accept his responsibilities in the real world. We must realize the dangers of our children playing this game. It leads to a distortion of reality and fills his mind with images of the occult. The game can become an almost mystical experience, consuming, addictive, and potentially dangerous. Let us pray for all those who are involved in Dungeons and Dragons. Lord, we ask that the truth revealed today will penetrate deep into the hearts of all those, especially the intelligent, gifted young men and women who have become entangled in Satan's web by playing this deadly game of Dungeons and Dragons. We ask that they turn away from these devices and look to you for forgiveness and strength. This we ask in your name. Amen. Thank you, Ben, for talking with me about Dungeons & Dragons. You're welcome. It was a pleasure being here, Joan. Your message has certainly been enlightening, and I look forward to reading your research on the game of Dungeons & Dragons in your book, Turmoil in the Toy Box 2. Are you shocked and dismayed at what you have learned about the game of Dungeons & Dragons? Do you know anyone who is involved in playing this deadly game? If so... You can help that person by giving him or her this audio cassette, The Truth About Dungeons and Dragons. Then purchase another cassette and give it to someone else. You'll be glad that you are spreading the word about the evils of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs>